We are here today to talk about the impact of climate change on migration and on human mobility, people entering and leaving cities as a result of climate change. Globally, it's estimated that up to 1 billion people could be driven away from their homes within the next 30 years. That is a staggering number. Marys, I want to begin uh, with you. This year, you've worked with mayors from around the world to establish the Global Mayor's Task Force on Climate and Migration. You've taken input from mayors around the world, and you're here at COP to present an action agenda. What's at the top of this agenda? Well, it's about making sure that mayoral voices um, are front and center of the global conversation and the, and the action on migration. They've been absent uh, in many ways. Uh, the migration work has been dominated by national governments, but I think mayors, cities have a unique perspective uh, to bring. Cities are nodes in flows. They exist because stuff moves. People move, finance moves, culture moves, and that's a very different perspective even in my own country from uh, national governments that often talk in terms of discrete identities and, and borders um, and protection. But we're very much talking about uh, you know, building resilience uh, within our cities in terms of our action agenda. Um, good cities, uh, good urbanization are more resilient in terms of climate change, but also um, offer more of a pool, a, a place where people can uh, uh, sit. Um, we're talking about offering uh, real leadership so that leaders are offering a you know, real welcome uh, to our cities, but also a just inclusive post-COVID recovery. Mm -hmm. as well, which is absolutely essential both for, for climate um, and for migration so that people from all backgrounds are included and benefit from the recovery. And we know that one of the biggest threats coming out of COVID is that it's the poorest and most vulnerable who were hit first and hardest, yeah. but then they're least well placed to benefit from any recovery when it comes. So we could be compounding those inequalities. So those are th very, three very important principles for us. Social inequality and migration and climate change are so closely interlinked, and I want to come back to that in a minute. Emmanuel, I want to come to you next. You're part of C40, which is a network of nearly 100 mayors from around the world, and you are an advocate for city diplomacy. Tell me, how does city diplomacy work, or can it work effectively when you also have national governments? So I think the task force that Mayor Rees has integrated is a, a very great example of the power of city diplomacy. It's bringing mayors and mayor voice, voices together to um, uh, build a common voice that will then influence global policy debates or national policy debates on different topics. Mayors have been very vocal on climate change for years, since um, uh, at least 20 years with city networks such as C40 or, or others, and we're seeing increasingly them uh, taking uh, action and, and being proactive on specific topics, such as the COVID-19 recovery you mentioned, and now climate and migration. And uh, this is really a powerful tool to ensure that the urban perspective, the urban interest, which reflects not only, obviously, the priorities of the mayors, but also the priorities of the urban population and the city dwellers in general, is a part of the global conversation. Common voice. Is it really possible to have a common voice when you're working with 100 mayors from different cities around the world? Because each city obviously has its own unique set of challenges based on its geography, uh, the socioeconomic status of the city. Is it possible to have a common voice? It is, but as always in diplomacy, we speak of common but differentiated. So mm. there, there are some common objectives, there are some common benchmark that we are setting ourselves but uh, obviously with differences in, and uh, nuances depending on, on where the city or the mayor comes from. And um, I'll, I'll take the example of um, uh, city access to finance. It's a global challenge for all cities, um, both cities in the global north and in the global south, um, struggle to finance the uh, transformative climate action they, they, they committed to do. But the modalities are a bit different. So we are working this global challenge uh, as a common um, advocacy project for all cities, but obviously with different approaches um, depending on the geographical origin of the cities. Rafaela, you work for one of Europe's largest foundations. How are you engaging with the mayor's task force? 
So first, we are a key partner of the, just as the 40 years of the Mayor's Migration Council and the task force they've um, put forward. And I first really want to say that this action agenda that Mayor Rees just presented is one that is really looking at the 360 degrees approach to, to climate and migration from protecting vulnerable population, including those displaced, to job creation for um, for, for migrants and everyone in cities, for, for greener economies and, and for, for resilience in, in their cities. So, so that's really an, a new thing and that's, that's excellent. And I'm really proud to share in this session for, for the first time that we as a Bosch Foundation um, have committed a one million US dollars to support this agenda um, for um, a so-called Global Cities Fund that initially has been set up by the Mayor's Migration Council last year mm -hmm. um, in order to, meet, uh, to, to support cities in, in um, supporting their residents, especially migrants and, and displaced communities in their cities. Um, because of COVID-19 and, and the really um, inequality that has risen in, in cities. And this mechanism is now being expanded also in collaboration with C40 um, to start with this first investment and we hope that others will join for um, what we call a Global Cities Fund on Inclusive Climate Action. Um, we will start with African cities and we yeah. will have a COP next year. Um, in, in Africa, but we hope to expand because it's really about um, when we talk about access to financing to showcase how financing can directly go to cities to address those issues and the recommendations um, the task force has been put forward. And um, just to add, it's not just us sitting here that recognizing the, the interlinkages. Um, a few weeks ago, the US President Biden has put forward a report for the first time recognizing climate and migration yeah. Um, being interrelated and the mayors, um, especially U.S. mayors, um, for example, Eric Garcetti from Los Angeles, for example, who's also a C40 mayor, mm -hmm. um, have, have sent a letter to, to the president and, and this letter and the rec recommendations is, is um, recognized in, in this report. So we really see a movement and I think our support, and as a foundation you can do grant making, you can support those great initiatives, but you can also invest in local projects um, to showcase um, how this leadership can be implemented locally. You talked about financing reaching cities, right? That's the goal that the, the money reaches cities directly. Mayor Rees, how difficult is that? I mean, we've just had this announcement of a million dollars. How do we ensure that the money meant for cities to combat climate change actually reaches cities? Well, there's a real example to be uh, followed here uh, with the, the Bosch Foundation's announcement in working directly with cities. It's one of the challenges we've brought, brought to COP um, mm. as a whole. Um, uh, it, it's, so I can look at no end of best practices, right? Yeah. I can go to no end of gathering of mayors. We can look at league tables of who's done the best green walls and retrofitted. But then the next question I face as a mayor is, well, how much did it cost? Right. right. I've got yeah. one revenue budget. If we put money into experts for uh, the, you know, consultants or whatever on, on decarbonisation, that's money we could have put into adult social care or children's mental health. And actually, sometimes the population are saying, hold on, we've got an immediate crisis here. Yeah. Why are you spending money on, on, on that? So it is raw. The, the challenge of finance um, is raw. And to be and, and the challenge we've been taking on with C40 as well, actually, have made this central, is, is how do you begin to make sure that, that mayors, <coughs> cities, have direct access to the finance at the scale, at the right time, that we need to, to drive on decarbonisation. And that, the access to that finance has to be made, it has to be there, irrespective of what national governments are or are not able to do. So, for example, look at the U.S. mayors in the United States, mayors like Eric Garcetti. Um, irrespective of what Donald Trump said, they said, don't worry, we're going to focus on decarbonisation. Yeah. Right? So, you know, we have to realise as well that the truth that you cannot tackle decarbonisation unless you decarbonise the world cities. So, identify progressive mayors, irrespective of what national politicians are saying, identify progressive mayors and then reach out to them. If I can just say there are a couple of challenges that we face that we know of. Uh, one is, 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 is getting the decarbonisation projects investment ready. That takes investment in and of itself. Mm -hmm. We don't always have that. So Yvonne Aki Sawyer from Freetown, the, she just had a catastrophic fuel explosion in Freetown. That's going to bring loads of costs. She has to spend money on that. 
right? So how do we make sure that, 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 that she still has access to the, to the long, medium to long term aim of decarbonizing uh, Freetown? And then there's the next challenge is scale. So sometimes individual cities coming through don't offer the scale that international investment needs. So how can we be a vehicles that will allow cities to begin to operate as, as collectives and enter mm -hmm. the market, you know, you know, at scale? So this is, this is where I've often said, you know, in many ways, what we are not talking about now is banners and T-shirts. We're mm -hmm. talking about experts in Excel sheets and people who can actually put these uh, deals together. But it has to transcend national governments because... To be perfectly frank, national governments are too often like punch-drunk fighters. You know, they're in the ring, they want to stay in the <laughs> ring, but they can't get the shots off. Uh, and I think cities can, offer, uh, can, offer, uh, can operate a, a level of dynamism that many national governments cannot. Emmanuel, you work with cities from around the world. Right now, tell me, the need is for investment into glo global south cities, is that right? Well, in all cities, but global south cities have... Particularly. Yeah, have... Uh, more needs perhaps than, than, uh, than global north cities. Um, and um, there's gonna be a, a huge opportunity next year to put that topic very strongly um, in the agenda with the COP27 in Africa. In Egypt. Uh, yeah. In Egypt. Yeah. Um, and um, we are building a, a roadmap of African cities to COP27 where precisely this topic of access uh, to climate finance will be central and the topic, obviously, of climate and migration as well, and mm -hmm. finance for climate and migration projects in the middle. Rafaela, you know, the main narrative about climate change and migration is usually negative. You know, we talk about displacement and people being forced to flee their homes because of a climate crisis. Is there a way to look at this through a positive lens? Is there opportunity when we see such uh, mass migration of humans from one area to another? So the short answer is yes. Um, <laughs> the, the longer one is most of climate migration initially happens internal. It's short distance. It's either disaster displacement or slow onset processes that forces people step by step to move. And where do they go to? The first place is the, probably the nearest city or where they would have um, relatives. So, so the question is really, and many cities are taking up on that challenge, is how to create green and inclusive economies in cities where urbanization is, um, is something positive, how mm. can the, the structures and the measures um, be adapted and that also include migrants and, and we need workers for the green transition, we need new skills, we need different skills development where that, that includes urban residents that have been there for a long time and, and migrants and even migrant workers that actively come to places to contribute to, to the green transition. And that is also part of the story and that's also very well reflected in the, in the action agenda that the C40 and, and Mayor's Migration Council have, have put forward. And, and that's a big part of the story and of course displacement happens, very dramatic life changes happen, um, but there can be also early adaptation mechanisms. So there can be, it doesn't have to come always to the, to the worst case scenario for, for mm -hmm. people, and that's, that's also part of, of, of the story. And um, yeah, and I think you, you can make it an opportunity, but you need investments in cities, and that starts with waste management, more people yeah. moving into cities that starts with slum dwellers and, and how, how slums, for example, are being developed, especially in global south cities, with social housing, with access to services, all the things that, that might not be related also to, to migration. That's my perspective where I'm coming from, but it is, because it's all coming with the question of people moving and, and settling somewhere new. In fact, the ILO says, it predicts that a move to a green economy will end up creating 24 million jobs between 2018 and 2030. Mary, tell me a little bit about job creation in Bristol. Are you being able to create new jobs as a result of Bristol moving towards a green economy? Well, we, we are. Um, Bristol's quite a you know, progressive city and we've got yeah. a thriving uh, green tech sector and, and we have a good brand and, and so that draws uh, you know, companies to Bristol who want to be involved in some of the the, the developments around uh, you know, green industries. But what we need um, urgently is the ability to plan. Mm. A, a phrase I've used a lot, 
you know, a friend of mine who's a senior army officer says, make a plan, any plan, just make a bloody plan. <laughs> so let's start with that. Yeah. yeah. So, so what we don't need right now is chaos. Right. right. What we don't need is more uncertainty. The world is chaotic as it, as it is. We potentially go over a tipping point. We're in more chaos. What we don't need is more uncertainty. With unplanned funding pots, unplanned you know, uh, uh, policy, what we need is to get ourselves organized in the face of this this chaos and so forth, I say, so for example, around finance, right? We're, we're taking finance seriously now. So what we don't need is 1,021 finance tracks that mayors then have to spend time navigating and understanding and it becomes mad. Mm -hmm. So we need finance to get organized, national governments to get organized. That will allow cities to plan. Right. So we can then think forward, okay, what is the shape of the economy gonna be in five years? We can then think about the skills that would be needed. We can then begin to plan for those communities that are furthest from the labor markets and economic opportunity, most disadvantaged, and plan their pathway in. Now, I'd say there's a couple of fronts on that, if I dare. One is that's good for migrant communities, and isn't. I, I find it a little bit uncomfortable talking about migrant. I am the product of migration. My, my great-grandmother was Irish, mm -hmm. settled in South Wales. My white grandfather came from South Wales to England. Migrant. My dad was a 12-year-old, came from Jamaica. So I'm the physical embodiment of migration and interracial migration as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, but it's good for migrants because then we can plan. But to, to tackle migration, we also look at indigenous populations, as it were. Right. right. How, how can how, people who feel that their lives are under threat, they've got no sense of their identity, they, then, they are then vulnerable to talking about those people coming over here and taking our jobs and taking our lives. Yeah. So we have to be able to plan inclusive economic development, both for migrants and indigenous communities, as it were, so that we can have a transition that is not preyed upon by opportunist politicians who might like to sow the seeds of political extremism. But that, that planning is essential to, to that jobs pipeline. I want to go back to talking about social inequality, which I know all of you are passionate about. As we get into the winter months, you know, the one thing that I think about is energy poverty. You know, energy prices are spiraling out of control and we could be in a situation where we will see families having to choose between paying for food or paying for heat, which is a very, you know, difficult situation to be in. Emmanuel, in your experience working with cities from around the world, what steps are being done towards creating affordable, clean energy? Mm -hmm. the, the energy crisis, I think, is a really good example of the joint challenges of climate change and uh, development and yeah. poverty in general. And um, mayors have understood that and, and they are taking action to tackle both together. So, for example, uh, retrofitting intensively uh, the housing in right. the cities. In the Global South, we speak more of upgrading informal settlements. Um, and this, uh, as uh, Mayor Rees was describing, is creating millions of jobs all over the world. So it's a virtual circle, uh, definitely, of climate policy and economic development. Um, and other thing they are doing is um, calling very strongly for a just transition uh, from, um, for all workers and all communities in the, in the green and low carbon transition. So making sure that no workers are left behind, the ones who have to transition from the fossil fuel energy system to a green energy system are uh, reskilled, upskilled and find new green ca uh, quality jobs. And also uh, that obviously the low income um, um, uh, communities uh, have access to affordable uh, energy uh, systems uh, in their housing. Marys, as a mayor of Bristol, what are you doing to ensure that your residents don't have to make that choice between heating or eating? Well, we're building, we've prioritized house building as our key policy tool. Um, so we're trying to, you know, we, we are building lots of houses and affordable homes. Um, and that's our, by our own definition of affordable at what we call social rent. So the homes we build are on heat networks, ground source heat, um, air source heat, and they're more efficient homes. The challenge comes with the existing stock, which is where we're talking about retrofitting 
at homes. That's a bigger challenge uh, because w while we want to retrofit homes, again, that costs money. Yeah. Right? And, and to be perfectly frank, and my cabinet member is up here um, as well um, in the next few days, even if we had the money to do it today, we don't necessarily have the skills to deliver right. that work. Right? So again, it, it, planning. Yes. <laughs> give us, so give us as much certainty planning. as we can. Mm. But what we are doing on that front is we have also made a real priority about tackling hunger. And around one in five children in Bristol are at risk of hunger. And it's going to be shocking as we talk about the global north and the global south. But this is the reality of modern day Britain. And it will be the same in places like the United States as well. Um, but by tackling hunger, we can also take the pressure off the household budget yeah. so they can actually uh, protect money for spending on, on heating their homes. So we need a plan and we need funding. And funding brings me back to you, Rafaela. What are some of the other creative ways to encourage funding towards cities so that people like Mayor Reese have the funds to make their cities more green? So I think one is really the, this tool that was established with the Global Cities Fund, which is a, is, is a one-time thing to, to direct funding to cities. And I think the, the bigger scale questions are how are development agencies, how are national governments directly giving funding to, to cities? How do these mechanisms align? If you talk about development aid, how to make sure that not every government has different funding schemes and, and, and different application processes so that cities are fed up in, in, in paperwork, in Excel spreadsheets, etc. Mm -hmm. So, so it's, it's really about the, the technical tools and, and how to approach that. But then it's also about the, the political will and the acknowledgement of the role of, of, of cities in national and international policies. And, and we come back to the question of, of diplomacy. Um, uh, formats like, like today and, and on Thursday, the mayors will, will again be very um, visibly present um, here at COP to talk about what cities can, can deliver and that it will pay dividends actually to, to, to invest directly in cities and to give them also the, the freedom but also partners who can support with the technical tools, with, with um, helping to, to bring a project to, to a stage where it can be implemented. And, and to make that a bit bigger, and mm -hmm. foundations really can just give an incentive, a start, um, uh, talking about ideas, um, and, and then hoping and, and calling on others to come in, but then also calling on governments to, to do that in a, bigger, in a bigger scale. And then lastly, I think um, at this COP, and especially at next COP, adaptation finance mm -hmm. needs to be bigger first, more needs to go to um, the global south and more needs to go to cities directly. Mm -hmm. and, and seeing that, I mean, there will be a big, big hope and aspiration for, for um, this week to, to be um, negotiated, but, but to work towards that also in the next year. And I think the mayors are, are very ready um, to do so with, with all, the, all the partners because that will really drive change and yeah. our role can be bringing those good examples. Um, to the table. Well, I hope we can come back and uh, meet you again. Um, so you want to have one last word? I'm out of time, but I will give you one last word. I don't want to talk. It's just, a, just, <laughs> yes. a, just as we talk, it's just about the language we use, actually. Yeah. And I think we need to not talk about funding. Uh -huh. There's a hierarchy and a dependency that comes with that language. Everything we do now around finance and good quality urbanization is an investment that will bring That's a, a direct return yes. or yes. it will reduce future costs and risks. Yes. And we have to talk. So when we talk about free time, we're not funding free time. We're investing, investing in free time. In it, and yes. there's a global return from that. I like, that's a good note to leave it on about investing in our future. And I hope we can meet again at COP next year and see how much progress we've made. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.